according to your Life is not my own. Life is not mine. And before we start that, we're going to start a new Bible study. We're going to start in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Bob to lead us in a, a song that will be our prayer for the start. Um, How's that? Sure. All righty. <laughs> Jesus raised me from the grave. So come now and walk with me. Oh, come now and walk with me. Together we our Lord shall be. Come now and walk with me. Because I was bought, the love was slain. What I cost to pay death's wage, now ransom died. Am freedom slave, my Jesus raised me from the grave. Father, we just thank you that your son Jesus raised us from the grave, that we have new life in him. And I just pray that we would walk in that new life, led by your word and your spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, like I said, we're going to start tonight in uh, 1 Thessalonians. So in 1 Thessalonians, uh, I want to give you a little background on this first of all, because I think it's important. Uh, Thessalonica, that's the name of the city. And this is in Macedonia. So this is Paul's, Paul went there on his second mission trip when he went to Philippi. Now, he had wanted to go someplace else, but the Spirit of God wouldn't let him. So he was led by the Spirit to Macedonia, and he went to Philippi. And if you know in Acts 16 what he went through, that's where he wound up in jail, right? Yes. And the Spirit of God set him free by shaking the earth, right? And then, then he goes from there to Thessalonica. 
Now, Thessalonica in New Testament times was one of the principal cities of Macedonia. It was a major, major city. It was what was called a Roman colony. Mm -hmm. So it was prosperous, it was influential, uh, and it had a significant Jewish population in addition to the Greek and Romans that lived there. Now, Paul traveled to there, like I said, in his second missionary journey, uh, and he didn't go because he wanted to go. He went because God sent him there. That was not his plan when he left on the journey. His plan was to go to the churches in Asia. And, and well, let me read you a couple of scriptures. In Galatians, Paul says, in Galatians 4.13, he said, But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. In Galatia, he got stopped there because he had a bodily illness, they, which they think was his eyes. And then in Acts 16, it says, They passed through Figurian and Galatian regions, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mystia, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So a lot of times, you know, it's like when we're, we're doing the work of God, we will have ideas and plans, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's always being open to being led by the Spirit of God. I think, you know, as we sit here and, and watch our friends in Leeds, it's, it's interesting because Alice and I just returned from a five-month journey. And when we left, it was our intention to go to Pakistan. And, uh, and God closed that door and made it impossible for us to go to Pakistan. And they, they, at the end of the day, they refused to give us a visa to get in there. So even though we planned it and there was nothing wrong with us making those plans and we had a lot of contact with pastors there, God directed us someplace else that he wanted us to go. Mm -hmm. So in ministry, that always has to be the way. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus in, in Revelation talks about how he opens doors that no man can shut, and he closes doors that no man can open. Amen. Amen. So the idea is just always being open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But it, it, it's good that we're on the move in the kingdom of God. and So he can steer us. So he can steer us. God. Yeah. You know, Alice has been saying for years that you can't steer a parked truck. It's got to be moving before you can steer it. So be on the move for the kingdom of God. Now, this is kind of important, and you'll see this as we go through the letter. I don't know if you know much about the Roman Empire, but Claudius was the emperor of Rome when, during this time when Paul went on his second missionary journey, right? Mm -hmm. If you know anything about the Caesars, he was kind of in the middle of some really, really, really bad Caesars. He was insane. Well, he, he at least, the thought is he pretended to be insane or men mentally incompetent because that way he didn't provide a threat to people so they wouldn't kill him as if they were killing Caesars left and right. However, the significance of this, now Paul wrote this letter, Paul went to Thessalonica probably around 51 A.D., Okay, and he writes this letter to the Thessalonians probably around 54 A.D., somewhere between 52 and, and 54. So it's not long after he went to Thessalonica that he that, to Thessalonica that he writes this letter. But in 49 A.D., just before Paul went to Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Claudius, the emperor of Rome, kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. And that's noted in Scripture, right? Now, the reason for this was, and there is outside of the Bible evidence of this from Roman writers, was that because the, the Christians were there, Christian Jews were preaching Jesus Christ, the other Jews were, re, you know, were getting all upset and rebelling against this. And because of all the trouble that existed, between the Jews and the Jews who were preaching Jesus Christ, it was cause, causing such a stir that Claudius kicked them out of the city, kicked them out of Rome. All right? Now, that, that's really important when we get into this letter, that because of Christians, Jewish Christians, preaching Christ, non-Jews uh, who had not accepted Jesus, who were still under the law, caused all kinds of problems for those Christians. To the extent it was causing such a disturbance in the city that they got kicked out of Rome entirely. Now Claudius was had very strong ideas about state religion. Now he was Rome was known for being very very tolerant of any any religion, but Claudius 
was restoring a patriotic religion to Rome. So he didn't mind Christians being there, he didn't mind Jews being there, as long as they didn't try and make converts, as long as they kept it to themselves. And that's a lot what we find today. You know, it's like, okay, you can practice your religion, just don't bother anybody else with it. Keep it in the church building on Sundays and it's fine. Right. As right? long as it doesn't make any changes. As long as it doesn't change anything or stir things up. Now, because, here's what I wrote, most importantly to our understanding of Paul's ministry here is that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome, Rome during his reign because of the unrest in the community caused by the preaching of Jesus. And that's noted in Acts chapter 18, by the way. In Thessalonica, it says that Paul went there and he reasoned with the Jews for three Sabbaths. That means he was there for three weeks. No more than, no, no more than, you know, he was not there for four weeks. He was only there for three Saturdays, right? Right. And in three Saturdays, he was used by the Lord to plant the word which started this church in the midst of so much opposition. Because of Paul's preaching for three weeks, this city was turned upside down. And there was so much uproar from the Jews who were there that they that the brethren had to send Paul away to Berea in the dark of night. That's what it says in scripture. Right? Yeah. Right. And it was so strong that the, the Jews that opposed Paul, when he went to Berea, they followed him to Berea to agitate and stir up the people against him there. That caused Paul to leave and go to Athens. That's in Acts chapter 17. And it says in Acts 17, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. So here's, now this is my hypothesis from that. This, Thessalonica was a prosperous city. There was a big Jewish community. They liked the status quo. They liked things as, as they were. They were comfortable. And they were afraid that if these other people started preaching Jesus, it would cause this problem again, and they'd get kicked out of Thessalonica. And they didn't want any trouble with the government. So they, they said, don't preach Jesus Christ. And when Paul did, they kicked him out or tried to chase him out of town. That's the background, okay? Got that picture? Yes. Okay, because it's important, because I think this is a situation we find ourselves in a lot. It's like, you know, don't go out and preach Jesus Christ if it's going to cause a problem. Well, you know what? In Scripture, it always causes a problem. All right. 1 Thessalonians, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, in the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace. Things, grace and peace. Silas and Timothy had originally been left behind in Berea as Paul made this journey. And then when he went to Athens, but as soon as he got to Athens, he called them to be with him. Now, this letter, by the way, the first letter to the Thessalonians, is considered to be, is probably the first letter that Paul wrote. You know, in the Bible, the order of, the, of Paul's letters that appear in the Bible, that's not the order they were written in. Okay. That's just, that's the order, actually, by the, by their length. And that's the way most of the, the things are, are um, situated. But it's considered that this was Paul's very first letter. And one of the things that I think is notable in here is if you look at virtually all of other, Paul's other letters, he'll start them, the vast majority of his letters, he starts by talking about, you know, Paul, an apostle, you, did you notice that? Yes. Yes. All of his. Yes. So, but here he doesn't. Yes. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think that the reason is he didn't have to mention his position because it was recognized. Mm -hmm. The church in Thessalonica understood that he was an apostle. He didn't have to stipulate it like he did to the Galatians. Mm -hmm. To the Galatians, he had to basically, and to the Corinthians. You're going to have to turn those uh, off because we're getting enough feedback. He had to basically defend his position as an apostle because they, they didn't uh, receive that. And one of the things I, I believe is, you know, it's not, it's not bad 
to say what your ministry is in the body of Jesus Christ. And your ministry in the body of Jesus Christ can be as simple as being a fireplace guy or a carpenter, because everybody, remember in the voice is what we talked about a lot at your house, Des, in Leeds, how everybody has a ministry. <laughs> so whatever your ministry is, but it's not about having to put a title on a business card. Yeah. I had somebody in this house years ago say to me, what's, what's your ministry? And I said, if you don't know what it is, I'm not going to tell you. You know, I, it's not because we should be able to see what God is doing in somebody else's life. Paul didn't need to explain what his ministry was to the church in Thessalonica because they knew what his ministry was. Yes. How did they know? First Thessalonians verse one, chapter, chapter 1 verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Now, this may seem like a, a little thing, but if you think about what mis most Christians give thanks for, mm. Right. I got a new job. Mm -hmm. Got a new car. I did this. God healed me. The things that we give thanks for. Mm -hmm. What does Paul give thanks for? Paul gave thanks to God for the success that he had in ministry, in building up the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God was his goal. The kingdom of God was his desire. The kingdom of God was his only interest. So he gave thanks when he saw God using him to fulfill his ministry. It wasn't about what was going on for him personally. It was what was going on for the kingdom of God. And that really ought to be an example to us. You know, how many times, how, how much are we being used by the Spirit of God that we know that God is using us to build up his kingdom? And that's what we should be giving thanks for. That's what we should be getting joy for. Yeah. Right? Okay, so they were thankful for the gift that the Lord had given them, success in their work, seeing lives saved and changed and the kingdom of God growing. They had income, increase, they prospered in the things that were important to them. And the things that were important to them were the things that had eternal value to building up the kingdom of God. And he says, okay, always making mention of you in our prayers. They were being faithful in their ongoing responsibility to those they had been used to birth, give birth to in new life. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. it's like a lot of, there's a lot of ministries today and they're, they're kind of, you know, you hit and go, you hit and go. And, and there's, but there's this ongoing responsibility that where God uses you in somebody's life. I don't know if you know, I think there's a old Indian, American Indian customs. It's like if somebody saves your life, you're responsible to them or... You know, it's like you're attached to that person for the rest of your life. It's when we go out and we're used by God to touch somebody's life. I think there's this ongoing responsibility. Well, there's a bonding that happens. Well, there should be. What I'm saying is that typically there's not. Typically, it's just like okay, you know, they go come and go and, and they're off again. But it's like Paul when he went someplace and he ministered. There was this ongoing. He was being faithful. Because he was always making mention of these people that he had left behind. Right, right, right. So he was staying, you know, he was staying connected to them, even if it was just by his prayers before the throne of grace. And that's important. So in, in verse 3 and 4, he says that he was constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. He's so I, I, mean, I, I like this. It says constantly bearing in mind. You know, when Jesus wrote the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation, if you've ever read them, and if you haven't ever read them, you need to go read them. Because he says, I know your deeds. Yes. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. I know where you dwell. I know your deeds and your love and your faith. Over and over he says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. You know, it says in Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 23, it says, Know well the condition of your flock. Paul knew. That's what he's saying. He was constantly bearing in mind what was going on in his church. But he'd only been in for three days. I mean, three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. He'd only been there for three weeks, and God used him powerfully. But he was staying in touch, 
praying, staying in constant prayer for them, and knowing what was going on. Because that was his flock. You know, a pastor has a flock. Apostles have flocks. Apostles have flocks. Yeah. You know, yeah. And this was his flock. And, and he knows what's going on. And this is one of the concerns I have in a church world today that is so focused on building mega churches, where, you know, how does anybody know what's going on in the midst of the people that they've ministered to? How can you possibly? You know, I, and I've shared this story before. Alice and I were at a, at a breakfast one time for a small group of pastors in Winter Park, Florida. And there were like 10 or 12 of us there. We were actually having a meeting about the work that was going on in the Dominican Republic down in the Caribbean. Caribbean. And we, the first thing we did was each of us went around the table and introduced ourselves. And there was one fellow there, he got up and he said, I'm so-and-so from this church and I'm, a, I'm a, a pastor of such and such at this church. And the fellow next to him got up and said, oh, I'm, I'm a pastor too from that church. They didn't, they didn't know each other. This is the first time These met. are two guys who are pastors, quote unquote, at the same church. They don't even know each other. Mm, How can you know well the condition of your flock? You know, this is, it says, from whom much has been given, much is required. So I can look like I'm staring right now into the living room of a house in Leeds, England. And I'm looking at a guy who is a dear brother in the Lord, who God has entrusted with a work. Amen. And now, brother, you shepherd in that flock. Hallelujah. Hello, Des. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's another interesting word that is used, and we, I think we often... We become very churchy in the way we understand scriptures. He says, for we know brethren. For we know brethren. And he's talking about relationship. He's talking oh, about absolutely. brothers and sisters. Absolutely. And this is, not, this is not some churchy term. He's talking about family. When we become family, guess what? You don't forget about your brothers and sisters. No. Your brothers and sisters are always on your heart. Right? Well, that's that's exactly a good point. That's I mean, this is this is a point that we've discussed here a lot of times. Yes. It's like, you know, when I, when Alice and I traveled, when we came up here, uh, if one of the times we came up here, very first, one of the first times, I think it was, and a, a fellow had traveled up with us from Florida, Joe, Joe Flanagan. Mm -hmm. And when we came up, I introduced him as my brother. <laughs> Oh, hey, brother. I said, well, he's your brother, too. You know, it's like we, we talk about the family of God, but we don't live like it was really a family. You know, and I said, this is a real blessing to me. And maybe that's why I'm more conscious of it. I was an only child until I got born again. And wow, what a big family I have now. I mean, I am sitting here in this room with my brother and sister, Bob and Pam. I am looking across the ocean on this in, through the computer I'm looking at my, my sister, my younger sister, my brother, my sister from Sri Lanka, and I know that Diva is hiding there somewhere from, the from Europe. From, and so, I mean, this is a family of God, and it's wonderful to have this kind of family. And I see more family arriving, arriving more family coming in, joining us at the Bible study and the living room in Leeds, England. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is, this is quite wonderful to be able to do this. Yes, look at all of this. Praise the Lord. We're, we're being joined by a, a, a mob. A mob. <laughs> <laughs> we're being joined. Oh, is that, is that there's Jonathan a voice. And... Jonathan David. Hallelujah. Okay, so this is, and Bob is absolutely right. It's easier to re maintain a, when you have a relationship with family. Oh, you know what? We can't hear them. No, you got to unplug the, uh, the speaker. From this. Uh, yeah. Oh, from the computer. From the computer, that little green one. Yeah. yeah, I know you all give us a little grace, and uh, because we're, we're doing this, as I said, for the first time, be careful pulling that out, because don't you add to me. Can you, can you say something now and see if we can hear you? Oh, yes. Hello, Jonathan. I see you, my brother. Hi. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear us? No, I mean you couldn't. Okay, we can now. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right, so so Bob's point is well taken. You know, when we really understand that we're family, it's much easier to stay in touch and stay concerned about one another. 
We're not just strangers passing in the night. Ships, you know, passing in the night. All right. Another, another, um, good, another good example of this is what you just read about um, that guy Joe Job in uh, Apple. What he said about his group. Oh, Alice is talking about Steve Jobs. You know, the fellow, the founder of Apple Computer. There was a, he just stepped down, uh, retired, left the company, quit because of his uh, health issues. But he was saying in an interview that he never had, he kept it in his development teams for Apple. He had 100 people, exactly 100 people, always 100 people. If he, had, if he wanted to hire somebody, he would have to let somebody go because he never let it grow over 100 because he said... He said that he knew he could not know more than 100 people. Well, you, you know, you can know them casually, but you can't know them. You can't have, he said he could not have a relationship with more than 100 people. So he never let, never let that core development team grow over 100 people. Uh, I, I think that's something that the church should examine because we need to know one another. We need to, to how can you love one another unless you know each other? Okay. So the Apostle Paul was as faithful to the doing of the word as he was to the preaching of the word. After listing the incredible hardships he suffered in fulfilling his ministry in his second letter to the Corinthians, if you know about that, where he talks about how he was beaten, how he was shipwrecked, how he went hungry, he says, apart from such ex external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. That's 2 Corinthians 11. So the, the thing that really was the concern for Paul was not the physical hardship. It was his care and concern for the state of the church. This was 2,000 years ago, right? So in this verse, then he talks about your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. And I, I thought, if you look at these three things, right? Your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. When Paul wrote later on to the church in Rome, look how this connects. This is Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. There's that steadfastness of hope, right? And perseverance, proven character, proven character brings about hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So you see these things, they absolutely connect with one another. Our work of faith, our labor of love, and our steadfastness of hope, they're interlocked. Now, I, I've shared with you guys all, that, that Alice told me once that the answer is always three. And as silly as that sounds, it seems to be true. Because God made things in his image. He made us in his image, and he's a trinity. Right? So. Let's just talk about those three things a minute. The works of faith. Your work of faith. That's what he said. Right? Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. Everybody knows that knows anything about Scripture that we're not saved by works. But when and Paul cautions all the times about all the time about works. Mm -hmm. But when he cautions about works, he's talking about what he says is the works of the law. When people think that that makes you right with God, all right. He consistently warns against the works of the law. But then he's in full agreement with James, knowing that faith and works are unalterably linked together when walking in righteousness. Paul wrote to the Romans, it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So it's not just enough to hear and have faith, you have to do something, you have to apply it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why James says in the second chapter of the letter of James, he says, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith has to have fruit. 
and that fruit is action, works. If faith doesn't lead to some action in your life, it's dead. All right? Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. So here's Abraham, the father of our faith. And it says, what faith gave him the power to do was the power to obey. That's the, you know, there's a lot of teaching on faith and very little teaching on obedience. So, the works of love, the labor of love. Paul also makes it perfectly clear that the goal is always love. He wrote to Timothy and said, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So that ties in the, the faith with the love, right? It's a labor of love. Because he wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, I think everybody's heard one way or the other, 1 Corinthians 13, mm -hmm, yes. the, that love chapter. He says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, so he's talking about works, right? It's labor, labor and works. Mm -hmm. But he says, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So the labor has to be a labor of love. It has to have as its goal love. Otherwise, it profits nothing. So all of our work, all of our labor is about love. Hope gives us the ability, the power to persevere, to press on to the goal. Right. Right. right? Romans 8. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Jesus said, those who endure to the end will be saved. Right? We've got to have that, that, that perseverance of hope. Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. So all these things that Paul is talking about here to the church at Thessalonica, you see, I mean... It, this was a, a, became the common theme through his preaching. You gotta hold fast and the boast of our hope firm until the end. And to the Philippians he wrote, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. Philippians chapter 3. So these three things, I mean these things that tie in together. We have to examine ourselves. Paul wrote that a man should examine himself mm -hmm. and see if this is what we're about. You know, are, are we working to accomplish these things? You know, are, are, that the work of our faith is a labor of, about labor of love and there's a steadfastness of, of hope. Because a lot of times, it's a very subtle thing. That you think, well, your work, the job you're doing, the ministry that you have is what makes you pleasing to God. No, it's not. That's not what makes you pleasing to God. Now, yes, you have to be faithful to the work that God calls you in, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what makes you pleasing to Him. What makes you? Because if you're doing the work, it's Him working through you. It's the Holy Spirit working through you. You can't take any credit. And it says in Isaiah that your own good works are as filthy rags. So we have to get to the place where, you know, our understanding of love is, first and foremost, is your love for the Lord. And if you have, first and foremost, is your love for the Lord, then you want to see all of the glory go to God. You don't want to take the glory to yourself. And when you love somebody, you're motivated to do things for them. Yes, you, you certainly should be. Yeah. Well, I'm motivated to do things for you because I love you. Did you all hear that? <laughs> Alice says that she's motivated to do stuff for me because she knows me. That's right. <laughs> I do. I hope I do the same. Okay. His choice of you. That's what Paul said. Listen to this now. These are just verses. Mark 13, 20 says, Unless the Lord had shortened those days, and this is when he's talking about the last days, mm -hmm. No life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. So the elect, that's us, were chosen by him. All right? You did not choose me, he says in John 15, but I chose you and appointed you 
that you would go and bear fruit. In Ephesians 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I'm just reading parts of these verses. And, and then, I said, we should always give thanks to God for you, beloved brethren, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in his second letter to the Thessalonians. So he's not taking credit for, any, for building this church in a three-week period. What he's saying is that it was God's choice. God has chosen you from the beginning. This is, if you don't, I, I don't want to get too distracted by this because it's there's no answer to this. But if you know what Calvinism is and Arminianism is, it's this great theological battle that has been going on for hundreds of years about whether we are saved because we chose Jesus Christ, accepted him as our Lord and Savior, or because he chose us. And we went, it says we're predestined. Right. Mm -hmm. The fact is, it keeps talking about how God chose us, how God chose us. But you know, it says that the Father's desire is that none should perish. So it's not like he chose some to go to hell. He didn't do that. But he foreknew. In that same passage in Romans, when he says, it says, whom he foreknew, he predestined. So he knew what our choice would be. Because it says, you know, that the, the verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever will. That, that choice is open that we can choose him as our Lord and Savior. All, as a matter of fact, the Bible study we did last Friday night was about choice, about choosing, talking about as soon as they came out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness, Joshua standing and saying to the people, choose you this day whom you will serve. you got to choose. When, when Elijah took the people up Mount Carmel and told them, you know, you, you've got to choose whether you'll serve Baal, this false god, or you're going to choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even to the apostles, you know, when he said, after people had left him because his word was too difficult, he turned to his apostles and said, how about you? Will you also leave? So he's telling them, you've got to make a choice. So there's always this choice on our part. But it's kind of like this joint whom he foreknew, he chose to be predestined to this salvation. So, you got to choose. Know, Alan. Yeah. Alan? Yes, sir. It's low, isn't it? That though he foreknew, he, said, he also says somewhere in there that, that he knew us before he formed us in our mother's wounds. That's right. Yeah. And I so, he knew us, that means every single person that, that's ever lived, mm -hmm. every, anyone who's living at this present time, and anyone who's ever likely to live, mm -hmm. God knew. Four new, so yes. Given all, each and every single one of us, from Adam right up to the last person who's on this earth, the choice. Absolutely. And each one of us is that the same choice. Absolutely. Amen. That's why everybody has to make that decision. Everybody has to, you know, there's an old hymn that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's a decision, it's a choice. And every human being that ever lived on the face of this planet is confronted with that choice. And they're given the opportunity. And you know what the choice is? God says, I set before you life and death. I set before you the blessing and the curse. He says, choose life. That's the choice. The choice is life and death. So he, he gives us free choice, but he tells us the right choice to make. And how... Sad it is that the majority of people will make the wrong choice. It's, it's hard to understand, except for the fact, you know, that God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and said, all mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. <laughs> God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, the whole head is sick. I mean, that's the only explanation for this is it's insanity. It's madness. It hmm. All right. First Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you, 
among you for your sake. Right? So, so his preaching was in word, in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. What did Paul preach in Thessalonica? Well, in Acts 17, it says this. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them. This is in, in Thessalonica when he got there. And for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. That's Acts 17, 2 and 3. So the gospel that Paul preached is the same gospel that he you know, proclaims to the Corinthians in, in 1.15, in the first letter in the 15th chapter. He's preaching Christ and him crucified. The Pharisees, you know, it says he, he preached in word and power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know, the Pharisees had the scriptures. They didn't have an understanding of the word. You know, you can have scripture without having the word. Because the Pharisees knew scripture backwards and forwards, but they didn't recognize the word when he walked through their midst. So they, they had the scriptures, and they oftentimes preached the scriptures, but they didn't do themselves what they preached. That's why Jesus warned against their hypocrisy, because they would say one thing and do another. And they had no power. Now the power that Paul speaks of here, the power that he operated in, was the power of God unto salvation. He's in this town for three weeks, and massive numbers of people get saved. Why? He's preaching the cross. Now he would write later to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, and say, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, Paul didn't just make this stuff up. I mean, obviously he's getting it from the Holy Spirit. But this is what he experienced in life. He goes to Thessalonica and he preaches the word of the cross. And people are getting saved, but other people are causing an uproar. And not only, not only are they saying no, but now they want to stop Paul. They want to stop him and, and not have this preached at all. So, it was the Holy Spirit... Paul received the gospel not from men. He says that, he makes that perfectly clear in the letter to the Galatians, in the letter to the Ephesians. And, and let me just read you this from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. You get that? You, you can talk to people and they'll say, Paul is the probably... Outside of Jesus Christ, he's the most influential man that ever lived. I mean, he took the Christianity that, that came from the cross of Jesus Christ. And he, he kind of was used by God to, to form this. He's the guy that built most of the theology of this. But still, he says, it's not, it's not my speech. He wasn't a good speaker. This is not false humility. This is the Spirit of God leading him in the truth. So why are we convinced today that you've got to be an excellent speaker in order to be used by God? Go back to the beginning with Moses. God selected Moses to be his spokesman. Here Paul is saying that he wasn't a good speaker. And yet, he said, but I've determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasion, persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians 2. Now, I, I believe in the power of God. But remember, when Paul talks about power, is it power of miracles? Well, praise God for the power of miracles. But it's the power of God is unto salvation. What, how great is it for somebody to get healed and not accept Jesus Christ? You know what? They're going to perish. That's temporary. But when somebody accepts Jesus Christ, that's eternal. This is the power that Paul had. And this is the power that was following him manifested because he preached Christ and him crucified. It wasn't because he was a persuasive speaker. It wasn't because he made great arguments. It was just because he pointed to Christ who said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And the power of God was falling all around him because people were being saved. Here's what he said, 
going on. He said, for us, to us, God revealed them. He's talking about the truth, right? The gospel. Revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And then he said, now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. Where, where did Paul know? All the things that he learned, he had all this great learning. And you know where that took him? Took him on the road to Damascus so he could go kill Christians. It wasn't until God blinded him on the road to Damascus and showed him the things of the Spirit of God that he started to have any use in the kingdom of God. The other thing was in that verse, it says, and it was with full conviction. Right? He preached with full conviction. Or in the King James, it says, with full assurance. Paul, if there was one thing, Paul would have seemed, I believe, to all the world like the most arrogant man that ever walked the face of the earth. And if there was one thing that Paul was not, it was arrogant. Paul was humble. But when you have absolute assurance, when you have absolute confidence, when you are absolutely persuaded and can't be shaken from what you know to be the truth, people can't stand that who don't have that same assurance. And they'll, they'll call you arrogant. Here is the foundation of Paul's ministry. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 37 to 39. Paul knew that God loved him. That God the Father loved him enough to surrender, to give Jesus Christ to die in his place. And he knew that nothing could separate him from that love of God. And that way, he could say, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Paul went out and literally turned the world upside down because of that persuasion. You know, I, I, remember, I remember years ago in New York, I don't remember where it was, but it was someplace, mm -hmm. and somebody walked up, they must have been, I'm not going to say what denomination they were, but they were very posh, very posh. Mm -hmm. And somebody walked up to me and said, oh, of what persuasion are you? And I said, I'm persuaded. <laughs> I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. If that's not what you're persuaded about, you know what? Go back to the beginning of that verse, right? In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him. If you're not persuaded of God's love, unfailing, unceasing, unchangeable love for you, you will never experience that constant victory in Christ Jesus that he desires you to have. That's what it's all about. It's all about knowing. I mean, we're afraid that God will... You know, put a loaf of bread on our table. He put Jesus Christ on the cross. Christ. You think he won't put a loaf of bread on the table? Praise God. That's right. It's calling to have communion with. Come on. But I mean, it's like, you know, we, we don't trust God for the little things when he gave his son Jesus Christ. And that's what it says. If he did this, what good thing will he withhold from us? That's right. That's right. Paul was persuaded. Nothing could change his mind. And it wasn't a matter of debate. You couldn't sit down and reason with him and say, well, have you considered? No. Have you considered the possible world if there is no God? You know what he said? He said, if there is no God, we're the most foolish of all men. But I am persuaded. That's right. Get persuaded. Get persuaded. Don't, you know what? You don't have to be a Bible scholar. No. All you got to do is know that Jesus Christ loves you. And, you. and you know how you can know that? Take a look at the cross. Mm. He didn't do that for himself. No, he didn't. He didn't, he didn't do that as a you know a church program to raise funds. Mm. He did it because he loves you and because he loves me. That's why he went to the cross. That's right. That's right. With full conviction. And then Paul says, "Listen, listen to this. Think about this." Paul said to these Thessalonians, he was only there for three weeks. Now, obviously. He was probably in touch with them by letter and by people going back and forth. 
They but didn't it, have Skype then. They didn't have Skype, no. Imagine what Paul could have done with Skype. Oh my goodness yeah. gracious. Oh my goodness. Praise God. Paul said to this church, he said, you know what kind of men we prove to be. What kind of man was Paul? He suffered hardship. He wasn't quarrelsome. He lived by faith. He wasn't fond of sordid gain. He wasn't addicted to wine. He was hardworking. He was mostly self-supporting. Paul was a man of God. And you want to know something? There was every bit of his life gave evidence mm. to what he was, to his character, to his proven character. Where did the character come from? Go back to what he said, because he preached what he knew. You know what he said? He said, tribulation That's right. leads to proven character. That's right. We try and do everything in our power to avoid every discomfort, every tribulation. But it's those hard things in life that build character. Mm -hmm. How many, how many, listen, look at the state of the church today. And I say this unashamedly, unabashedly, and without any apology. How many pastors, you know, especially the large churches, that could or should stand up and say, you know what kind of person I am? Mm. How many people are there like Paul whose lives are open? It's an open book and he's not afraid to have you see every bit of his life. It's like, you know, we're afraid to have people see what's going on, what's where we are. But you want to know something? Whatever is done in dark will be brought to the light. You want to find out? Your life should be an open book. Because the book that your life should be is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there shouldn't be anything in your life that you need to hide. And you know how you can get around that? By doing what the Word of God says, what Paul says. Confess your sins one to another. Get them out before somebody finds them. Deal with them. And when you have what Bob was talking about before, a real family relationship, where you're in fellowship with people you know love you, with the love of God in their, in their hearts, then you won't be afraid to confess your sins one to another. And when you confess your sins one to another, there's nothing to expose. That's right. People will know what kind of person you are. And you know what kind of person you're going to be? Just like them, human beings. But human beings move by the power of the Spirit of God, move by the power of the love of God. Amen. People who can, like Paul, change the world around them because of the Spirit of God, because they can go out and preach the gospel in power yes. and with full conviction. Oh, yeah. It's not as I'm going to go on the internet this week and buy a sermon to preach on the behind the pulpit this week. Get over it! You better not. <laughs> okay. Now think about this. I said before that a shepherd should know well the condition of his flock. I didn't say that. No. Actually, Solomon said that. I'm telling you what Solomon said. Know well the condition of your flock. Paul knew his flock. But his flock knew him. Not by who he said himself to be, but by he proved himself to be. You know, in most successful churches today, and I say successful and I put quotes around that, because that's successful by the world standards, and what makes them successful is they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, I've been in churches uh, where people tell me, oh, I was talking to pastors, you know, Pastor so and so said, they don't even know these people. They don't they don't know what these people are. The pastors don't know them and they don't know the pastors. It's somebody they see behind a pulpit once a week and they don't know anything about them. That's a fact. The pastor doesn't know them and they don't know the pastor. Not in reality. And you know what? I'm I'm staring here, at a little home church right there, across the pond, thousands of miles away, and I know that I'm looking at a man right now who is not ashamed or afraid to have people know who he is. That's right. That's right. Amen. And I trust that that you will each over there get to know one another and in a true family relationship. Because until you do that, until you can actually know each other, mm -hmm. until you know that somebody has proven character because of the Spirit of God within him, then you'll never be able to deal with the next verse. Because the next verse says this, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Paul said, Therefore be imitators of God, beloved children, and walk in love, 
just as Christ also loved you. Paul said, imitate God, imitate God. But he also said in 1 Corinthians, be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. What an incredibly, incredibly bold statement to say, you should imitate me. But you want to know something? He had a full assurance. I, I talked one time, not, not too long ago, I remember really where it was, just talking about, because we got into this whole study before, months and months and months ago, before we left for the UK, about going in and finding the things that are pleasing to God by doing a study of the churches in Revelation. And ultimately, one of the things I said, you know, you can test and you should test what's going on in your life. But the best way to know that what you're doing is pleasing to God is this. Because you spend your life in communication with Him. It's called prayer. Prayer is not talking to God, it's talking with God. And when you are pleasing to God, you will hear this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God will tell you that you're pleasing to Him. And there should be nothing in the world that brings you more joy than knowing that what you are and what you're doing is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hallelujah. Even though we have a five-hour time difference here between us and Leeds, England, we've gone through the hour very quickly. Hallelujah. So we'll, we'll pick this up again next time, same place, same station. And it's been a blessing. So hallelujah. Father, I just thank you, Lord God that you made this possible. Lord, that we can join with each other, even at a distance. And Lord, the bond that we have with each other's life is you. Lord, that you are, are the bond in our lives, that you have made us one. You have made us one family, because now through your work and your love, we have one Father. We share the same Father, born again into the same family. We are the family of God. So Father, we thank you for that great gift. But most of all, Father, we thank you for that one brother, the firstborn among many brethren. We thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus. And I pray that through these studies we might see him more clearly, that we might be more like him, that we would truly desire, above all, to be imitators of your son, Christ Jesus. So I thank you, and I praise you, and I bless your holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. Bye, brothers.